team. Basically, as an individual board member, you have no more rights than any other member of the public. Um, that all of your power, all of your authority comes when you're sitting at the board table with the majority of your board members in a legally constituted meeting. So that's when you, as a board member, that's how you make a difference. So you don't make a difference by going off and doing things on your own, coming up with what your own ideas are. Each one of you comes to this board table. You have different skills. You have different talents. You have different backgrounds. How can you bring them here to this board table and make this group as strong as you possibly can? How can the nine of you build and work off of each other's strengths so that your team is what's strong? That's how you make a difference, not by what you do as an individual. Here again, some hypotheticals of similar type things where a personnel committee in getting complaints from parents um, sent a negative evaluation to a third grade about a third grade teacher. So again, as a board member, you only evaluate one person, and that would be the superintendent. Um, this next one is kind of interesting because it could go either way, depending. A board member is visiting schools to check on the technology upgrades. So that one, you know, people like some people say yes, some people say no. So if you think about um, the situation of perhaps, you know, you have just implemented a bunch of new technology. It's being used in the classroom but really effectively, and the superintendent said, I would love for board members for you to come in and see how this is working, see the great things our students are doing. So then you would go through a process of doing that um, versus somebody just finding you wandering the halls and poking your head in the classroom and asking questions. So in one way, it is appropriate and effective. In the other way, it would be considered outside of your role. Um, and then the last one was a board member creates a Facebook page and invites parents and staff to join and air their concerns and questions about the district and says this will promote two-way communication with stakeholders. So again, you know, the, the use of Facebook, the use of social media by board members is becoming more and more prevalent, it's becoming more and more of a topic of discussion. Um, so it's important, you know, that we all understand as board members that we don't lose our First Amendment rights, but we have to understand what we talked about on the first page, on the very first slide of the, the trust and the confidence of the people that elected us, that we do, we are elected of public officials. And part of our responsibility of doing that is that we have to uphold the code of ethics. So when we find ourselves in a situation like this, we have to make it clear that we are not speaking on behalf of the board, we have not been authorized to speak on behalf of the board, and that we have to, at all times, keep the code of ethics in mind. So we can't divulge confidential information, we can't do anything that would um, speak negatively of our staff. So any of these tenets of the Code of Ethics that we're going around the table reading now, we are still beholden to them as we exercise our First Amendment rights. We, are. we have to do them in concert together of that, plus still um, be mindful of the Code of Ethics. We can't separate the two. And one of the things with that is the Code of Ethics uh, requires us to be respectful of the, of the chain, chain of command. So um, if, for instance, on our Facebook page, uh, a community member, uh, Pat, what have you, has some sort of complaint about uh, something that's going on in the district, uh, the um, response from that board member uh, needs, to, needs to be, one, uh, did that person follow the chain of command in terms of did they perhaps bring the complaint to the teacher or the principal or the superintendent um, before uh, it rises to the board level. Because remember, as an individual board member, we have no power. So um, to say, uh, to respond to that with, oh, I'll take care of that for you. Well, that uh, would not be appropriate because the Code of Ethics says that there's a chain of command. And I, as a board member, will only get involved 
after the administrative process has been completed. And that, and that can be difficult because uh, as board members, uh, we got elected uh, and uh, we may have gotten elected on uh, a platform of saying, oh, we will solve problems. And then uh, once we get on the board, we realize, oh, the proper way, though, to solve problems is as a board, and I am only one part of that board, that, that can be difficult because there's, uh, in one sense, a shift that we have to make from being a, a board member candidate uh, to uh, becoming a uh, full-fledged board member. So I have a question um, in regard to the statements you had prior that as individuals, we need to come together as a board. And if the school district now has a Facebook page where we should try to encourage people to go to uh, their comments uh, issues. Um, would you then say it's not recommended to board members to have their own Facebook page to do that if, as a board and a community as a representative community as a board together, we should be united and have the folks go to the one source that will give them the information that they need. Is that something that you would recommend or is that a practice that other school districts have? I mean, there should be, you know, in most of your policies, you identify an official spokesperson for the board to make sure that, you know, the board majority is the opinion that's being represented and being put out there into the community. So for you to individually have your own position, again, Again, you're stepping on that line of your First Amendment rights says that you're allowed to do that. You just have to make sure that you do it in the context. So to answer your question, is it best practice for each one of you to have your own pages and you know discussing board business on it and school district business? You know, obviously not. The best practice would be that the district has one voice, that the district um, is communicating a unified message and it's important for the community to get the facts, get the information you know, from a source that is speaking on behalf of the board majority. Uh -huh. So, Council, in your example, if a community member expresses um, some complaint publicly on Facebook and a board member responds with, you know, I'm sorry to hear that, or, or just responds with, hey, did you call the teacher, or why don't you call the teacher, or call the principal, or you know, whatever the chain of command um, would be, or do you know that there is a chain of command, here is what it is, um, where is that on that line, is that on that line, is that appropriate, inappropriate? Well, I mean, Facebook works the same way as uh, senior constituents in the grocery store. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, just like when your constituents come up to you in the grocery store and they say, hey, did you hear about whatever the particular situation is? Again, the proper response from the board member is, I hear you, but I, ca I can do nothing about it at this point. You must uh, go through the chain of command. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I will refuse to surrender my independent judgment to special interests or partisan political groups or to use the schools for personal gain or for the gain of friends. And here, so, um, as we think about it, and John talked about it a little bit, that when you are running for the board, you may be running on a particular platform, you may be running for a particular reason, you may have you know, groups who have sponsored you, and. Um, want to make it clear that, again, once you get on this side of the table, remember that slide where we talked about all children? Well, now that's the only group then that you are beholden to, is that when you are now a board member, your responsibility is not to these other groups, your responsibility is to all of the children in your district. Okay. Oh, I, I have a question. Sure. So back to the Facebook page, the personal Facebook page, Let's say that prior to becoming a board member, there's a Facebook page that you've established for your campaign, um, and then now you are a board member. Is it proper to abandon that Facebook page? 
um, or if that Facebook page is picked up by future candidates, you're still on the Facebook page, is that a conflict of interest? Well, the answer would be this. Is the use of that Facebook page within the confines of the Code of Ethics? That, that's really where it comes down to. I don't know of a school ethics decision or advisory opinion that says you must leave uh, your uh, Facebook page and either abandon it altogether or start a different one uh, now that now that you are a board member versus being a candidate, but the but the the issue comes down to is my conduct on that Facebook page uh, within the requirements of the code of ethics. Like right now, the only information that you know the advisory opinions will come from is from people who wanted to write letters to the editor. Mm -hmm. So again, that's a public kind of. You know, communication vehicle. So we're using that advisory opinion and using it to address um, social media because there have not been specific um, situations yet that would help address these. So we're assuming that the same principles apply. Right. I'm aware of uh, one uh, complaint decision de dealing with a board member's Facebook page in which uh, they were critical of an administrator and. Uh, in that instance, um, uh, the School Ethics Commission did find uh, that the manner in which the board member was critical in terms of uh, calling the superintendent various names, uh, they did find that to be in violation of, of the School Ethics Act. And certainly, uh, what I can do through uh, Charlene is I can uh, provide you all with copies of uh, the advisory opinions dealing with um, how to express your opinions, and also um, uh, this complete decision that I'm aware of with regard to um, uh, the board member who was uh, complaining about the administrator on Facebook. Tell them what they actually call them. In this complaint, what did they call the superintendent a, a terror? Or you clicked on the picture of something of a terrorist and the superintendent's picture came up? So how's that for inappropriate behavior, right? Okay. I will hold confidential all matters pertaining to the schools which it disclosed would needlessly injure individuals or the schools and all other matters. I will provide accurate information and in concert with the fellow board members, interpret to the staff the aspirations of the community for the schools. So again, you know, confidentiality is so important. You know, a lot of times we get asked, well, okay, I hear all kinds of information. When you talk about confidentiality that I'm responsible for, what are you talking about? What specifically do you mean? Um, and it's basically those conversations that you have in closed session, you know, that the, there have been topics identified that you can't talk about in public. And basically, most of them are protecting the rights of your students, they're protecting the rights of your staff, they're protecting the legal rights of the district. So there are all reasons why you, as a board member, have the responsibility to protect those rights and maintain that confidentiality. And that's why you're held accountable to doing that. Um, and also that we talked about, the yeah, important to um, having accurate information. So that was another thing in one of the advisor opinions that came out about the person that wanted to write the letter to the editor that you know, the School Ethics Commission said, okay, you have to make sure that you don't disclose anything that's confidential. You have to make sure that all the information that you do provide is factual. They're, you know, again, being taken from this um, tenet of the Code of Ethics. Um, again, to help explain some of these, here's a board member that wanted to serve as an advocate for his brother and sister-in-law when they met with the child study team to discuss their daughter's IEP. There, you know, as much as it seems like it's someone from your family, perhaps you should do that. If we think about the fact that you're responsible for all children, this is changing that perspective, and you're now providing, you know, a responsibility for just one child, and that's outside of your role as a board member. Obviously, except when it's your own child, that you never lose that right that you have as a parent. 
Um, here's an interesting one that Don talked about a little bit, that what's that difference when you're running for the board versus when you're on the board. Um, and so here's a candidate running for their first term on the board and promises in their campaign that they're going to do everything in their power for the district to have an ice hockey team next year. Um, so as we think about it, they're not a board member yet. So they can say whatever they want. Um, and if, if we're finding more and more that this is happening and people that are board members are calling me and saying, Charlene, it's not fair, you know. They're getting up and they're saying this, that they're going to do this, this, and this, and I can't respond to any of it. I can't say things like that. Um, but that just, you know, until you get on this side of the table, um, that's when it changes. Um, board president asked the guidance council why their neighbor's child didn't get into the National Honor Society. So again, taking an interest of one particular child versus looking through the lens of all children. I guess we're going around again. I will vote to appoint the best qualified personnel available after consideration of the recommendation of the chief administrative officer. So this kind of goes back to your question before about hiring. You know, a lot of times there's a perception that the board can hire and the board can fire, and really that's not the case. All the board can do is approve or disapprove the superintendent's recommendations, and even those disapprovals can't be done for arbitrary and capricious reasons. So if you are going to disapprove a recommendation, it has to be for a valid legitimate. Oh, can you give an example for a valid reason? Like if, if the superintendent is recommending a teacher, and, and many of us aren't teachers, right? Like what would be a valid reason to disapprove? Well, let's say for instance, um, uh, for whatever reason, uh, the uh, uh, recommended candidate, um, in your mind, you believe that there are other, perhaps more qualified candidates. And um, if that's the case, then uh, certainly you can exercise your uh, responsibility as a board member to um, uh, reject that recommendation if you believe that there are other qualified candidates um, who are more qualified than the one that you have before you. Uh, what what I, I believe that this uh, also goes to is we want to make sure that we're um, doing things uh, in a non-discriminatory way so that um, uh, we want to make sure that uh, we're really uh, approving and voting on uh, a rational basis of making sure that we have the best qualified candidates and not, and not because um, uh, they may be our uh, friend's child or, or any of those kinds of things which would be um, perhaps a violation of the code of ethics, and certainly would uh, might also be a violation of, of other laws as well. Thank you. Okay. I will support. I will vote to. I'm sorry. I will support and protect school personnel in proper performance of their duties. And this goes to not just when you're sitting here at the board table, but again, if you're on Facebook, again, if you're on the ball field, whatever situation you find yourself, that you are responsible for your conduct in supporting um, school personnel. Okay. I will refer all complaints to the Chief Administrative Officer and will act on the complaints at public meetings only after failure of an administrative solution. And John kind of talked about this one a little bit in response to your question, but you know, we kind of summarize this one by saying that as a board, you should consider yourselves to be the court of last resort. You should be the last place that a staff member, that a community member can come to to get a resolution to their situation. So if you involve yourself in the process any sooner than that, how are you going to hold the superintendent accountable for the outcome? You've already tainted the process, you've stirred the pot, it's now difficult to hold someone else accountable. If you've been involved in the process sooner, what happened to that court of last resort? It's gone. The board's already been involved in the process. Where's the person going to go? So as much as you think you're doing them a favor, as much as you might think you're helping, 
you're actually taking that right away from them. You're taking that chance away from them to come to the board after they have, you know, after they've gone through the whole chain of command. So it kind of goes back to what John was saying too, that even if someone comes to your board meetings, if, if someone comes to you as an individual and wants help, wants your assistance, it goes back to only after failure of an administrative solution can and should the board become a Okay, any questions about, just go through this one. any questions at all about the code of ethics then? Okay, so now we're gonna get into the conflicts of interest. Um, and this is, when do you need to recuse yourself? When can you not take part in a discussion? When can you not take part in a vote? And it would be if there is a benefit to you as a school official or a member of your immediate family. And that's defined as spouse, child, parent, sibling residing in your same household. So that's what's considered your immediate family. If you find yourself in that situation and you can see that there might be some benefit, some financial involvement, any kind of thing that would be construed as a benefit, that's then when you need to recuse yourself. Um, in the board that I was on, one of the, my board members, his wife worked in the district. They took the district's health benefits. So every time as a board we had to vote on that check to approve the health benefits payment for that month, he would always say, I recuse myself from check number blah, 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 because that then was a financial benefit to his family. Um, now sometimes I get asked, like, what happens if I, you find yourself in a situation where, like, let's say you have a fourth grader and the fourth grade's going on a field trip, and as the board you need to approve that field trip, do you have to recuse yourself from that? And the answer is that there's no greater benefit to your child than any other child in the fourth grade class, then you don't have to recuse yourself. It's not a particular benefit to your family, it's a benefit to that whole class. Um, all of you, every board is required to have a nepotism policy. Um, and here it provides that definition that I just gave you of spouse, child, parent, sibling residing in the same household. And so it's important that we, as we're going to go through this, to remember that this refers to an immediate family member. Because the state's going to give us a definition of a relative next. So we need to make sure that we understand the difference because we're going to see examples of when is a conflict for an immediate family member or when is a conflict for a relative. So we need to understand what the difference is between the two. So the immediate family member is, is this. Relative, okay, now we got this big definition um, of, and it's not only are they related to you, but are they related to your spouse or partner? So that same relationship. Um, and just when we thought that everyone was included in here, um, some of these advisory opinions then started coming out and adding people to the list that got left off. Um, so one of them was, and they are using this word other. There's a phrase other in the, um, in the School Ethics Act so that if this relative, this definition wasn't quite broad enough, this is what gives them the right then to expand it. Um, so they added other as when someone asked for an advisory opinion about their first cousin working in the district, they said yes, we would consider that to be um, a violation. Someone said, okay, what about my cohabitating partner? Yes, then they ruled that they would consider that to be conflicted in that interest. And then there's that ex-spouse example that I had given you earlier. So these are all situations where as this is becoming a big, broad definition and getting even bigger. So how this impacts then us is that districts may not hire a relative. So that big, broad definition of a board member or a chief school administrator um, since 2008 that the superintendent can't recommend to the board a relative, and a district administrator may not exercise any direct or indirect authority over a relative. Um, you say that exceptions can apply, and what that exception is, is if you find yourself in a situation where you have a really challenging position to 
Bill, like let's say maybe a physics teacher, and there's not a lot of them out there, and if you have done your due diligence, you've done everything you can to try and find the best person, and it turns out that that best person is a relative, the superintendent can go to the county superintendent, explain the process that you went through, and explain why this is the best person, and the county superintendent can give you a waiver then to hire. Um, there is also uh, the exception for uh, summer home, um, and um, the regulations do permit um, you to have an exception in your policy for that. But again, what we're talking about here is the fact that uh, the state requires each board to have a policy, and um, the policy must have all the elements um, uh, that they require. Uh, and, and, that's, and that's really the key. And then the second thing is, you know, as board members, we should uh, at least be aware of the rudiments of that policy uh, so that we can uh, conduct ourselves accordingly. I just looked at that. That was the video clip of my but we have John here in person, so I pumped in. Okay, so we talked about then, now that we see what that definition of relative, we talked about hiring, but how does it impact you as a board member then, um, if you needed to vote on the, evaluate the superintendent, if you needed to vote on the superintendent's contract, um, saying that if you have a relative working in the district, that you're out, you can't participate, you can't take part. Um, what was interesting in this advisory opinion that came out about a superintendent search, that it was one of the first times that the state ever provided this much, um, when you look at how well they broke it down and said, okay, not only can you not participate, you can't um, vote on the advertising, the search firm, the anything that has to do with it. So they really provided a lot of clarity um, in their thoughts about this. So anything having to do with the, the superintendent um, and any of the employees in the chain of command between your relative and the superintendent, as a board member, you are you know, not able to participate. Um, here's where Don talked about that, that student summer help. Um, you can hire your board member's child to work here in the summer only if your policy provides for it. But then the School Ethics Commission says, but okay, then when they're here, you're now considered conflicted and you can't participate in you know, any of those things. Um, they added as part of these advisory opinions they, that came out substitute teacher. That never used to be on there before. That never used to be considered a conflict. Um, if your relative is a substitute teacher, that now is considered a conflict. Okay, so now let's talk about then we talked about hiring, so now let's move to negotiations, collective bargaining. So again, if you have a relative, a big, broad definition that works in the district, you're out. It used to be that you could vote, like you couldn't take part in any discussions, you couldn't take part in anything until they got to the very end and they had a final agreement and the salary guides were done, but that got changed again, that got changed too. So now you're just flat out out and can't participate. Um, and any board members, if any of you are running for the board and you get endorsed by the union, um, you are out for, is it one year, John? Yes. So you're out for one year of being able to participate after you get elected. Okay, so now we talked about if your relative works um, in the district, but now let's talk about what happens out of the district. So um, here we go back then to the, that it only impacts you, um, we go back to that immediate family member definition. So if someone's spouse, child, parent, sibling living in your house, if they live in your house and they work for a similar union outside of your district, you are still considered to be conflicted and cannot participate. Um, if the person is the relative, that big broader definition, then what they have ruled is that you can participate unless your relative has heightened union involvement. Um, if they are a 
you know, a building rep, a union officer, something like that. So, you know, one of the kind of the guest jokes sometimes as we're doing this is saying, okay, you know, now you got to call your cousin in Cape May and say, uh, do you have high union involvement? Because I need to know so that whether I can participate in negotiations in Dover or not, you know, but that's kind of the way it, it's gotten that, you know, as they're making these um, stipulations on us. Um, with respect to the administrators, you know, sometimes you might find yourself with your superintendent or the business administrator. I know one of the, did this a couple weeks ago, and the business administrator said that his wife was a teacher. Um, so he's like, she lives in the house with me, so, um, yeah. so it made him conflicted. And so you um, are not able to sit in the room with the board while they're um, you know, taking part in negotiations. You can be in another room somewhere, and you can provide technical assistance only if there's no one else that has that same level of expertise to assist the board. They relaxed that a little bit from the original rule that yes. they had because you could be on negotiations if you had a teacher yes. in the family. Yes. No matter where you were. Yes. Yes. And fine. <laughs> Luckily, they saw the light. Yeah. Well, I don't know that. Um, well, at least it, a little bit. Um, here, somebody had asked me the question when I did this last night, and they said that they were an administrator in another district and wanted to know whether they could participate in negotiations with the teachers union. And, you know, I said, well, the, the question comes down to, is there any linkage between your association and between the, the teachers association? If there's no linkage between the two associations, then you're okay if there is bound to be some linkage between, even though they're two different associations, then you would be considered to be and uh, this also applies to um, if you have uh, other unions in your district, uh, for instance, let's say uh, your custodians may be represented by the Teamsters Union or those kinds of things. Um, uh, again, uh, the key is whether or not there's any linkage um, uh, uh, between those contracts. Or, um, you know, let's say uh, there's the NJEA and the AFT. Um, uh, one might consider those different uh, unions, but indeed um, uh, they may be considered similar depending on uh, whether or not there's any linkage there. And that was one of these new advisory opinions that came out, is that it used to be those used to be considered separate and not a conflict. It used to say same union, now it says same or similar. Okay, so just when we think that the School Ethics Commission has rolled on enough things to tie our hands they now have tackled volunteerism. So all of us, most of us have gotten our start as board members because we are active members in our community. We do like to volunteer. And now people have asked for advisory opinion about that situation and they have ruled on it and saying sometimes it's good and sometimes it may be outside of your role as a board member. Um, this kind of came up um, from someone who was assisting in the school play. His wife had, I don't know if she worked in the district, but had an integral role in the play. This person was helping out. Turned out they had some oversight of like funds, um, help directing the staff, had a lot of contact with students. And I think in the opinion that it also said that they uh, um, had some role in assigning parts for the students as well. So the School Ethics Commission said, you know what, if you're supposed to be a board member, if you're supposed to be viewing the district from this 50 foot, you know, 50,000 foot roll up here, and you are in the building enmeshed in something that's going on, then we would consider that to be outside of your role as a board member. Um, you know, there was someone else, I know, an advisory opinion was asked about someone who started a club in the middle school and doing coin collecting with Again, he was in there every week, had direct contact with the students, came back and yes, we would find that to be a violation. So that person actually quit the board and decided that that was something that they felt, you know, that that was their way of giving back and they preferred to do that instead. Um, so what is okay is one time infrequent, you know, activities like, you know, reading to the class on Dr. Seuss Day, chaperoning a class trip, and you can volunteer in things outside organizations that are, um, 
you know, might be related to the school, like the PTA, but they're their own separate organization. Or like, you know, Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts who have clubs or have, might have their meetings in the schools. Again, they're separate organizations from the school district. Um, same thing like with coaching, that you might be coaching through the rec department. Um, that's okay, but it's not okay if you were coaching one of the school district teams on a volunteer basis because it is a school-sponsored activity. So that's kind of where they're drawing the line. And one of the keys with this is this is still an evolving area. For instance, one of the um, advisory opinions had to do with a, um, a parent who was also a board member, and they volunteered with the marching band by um, transporting the marching band's equipment from uh, uh, school to school. And in that situation, they said that that was okay uh, on the basis that um, he, he um, was not um, directing students. Um, it wasn't necessarily regular um, because it was only during the marching band season. But um, again, if you have uh, any kind of involvement uh, in the school and you're unsure as to whether or not uh, that involvement uh, would violate the act, uh, now would be the perfect time uh, to ask for that advisory opinion from the standpoint of uh, uh, students are not in session right now, and so you could, you could get that advisory opinion and, uh, and know that what you could do uh, come uh, September. I mean, sometimes you may find yourself in a situation where you may just have to recuse from voting. You know, when I was on my board, I was the treasurer of the high school booster club. So then every time the booster club then donated some equipment to the to the district, I would recuse myself from voting on that donation. Um, so these were the things then we kind of talked about a little bit where they said, you know, would be a violation if you had supervision management or direction of school personnel and funds, regular contact, active day-to-day -day presence, enmeshed in the building. So those types of, you know, situations where you, again, are outside of that role of a um, and then kind of one of the last things then that we that has been touched on recently is interview committees. And basically, you know, someone had asked for an advisory opinion about board members participating in um, committees to interview staff. Basically said, you know, as a board member, you have one employee, and that's the superintendent. So they don't recommend that board members participate in the process. Um, understanding, though, that it is the superintendent's responsibility, it's the superintendent's um, role to do that. Sometimes the superintendent may reach out to the board, may reach out to you know, other members and want to expand the scope of the interview committee um, to do that. Switch on, because then it goes into more of um, an explanation. So, okay, if we, we, we find ourselves in a situation where the superintendent is asking for some board assistance. Um, and again, it's up to the superintendent to do that, then they even give us some guidance. And so we would recommend it only be one or two board members, administrative staff coordinated. You can only make observations, again, with the understanding that any hire is based on the superintendent's recommendation. Um, so in light of all the things we talked about, all the ways that you can potentially be conflicted, you know, we suggest that as a board that you keep a list. If you do have people that might be conflicted from certain things, to make sure that as a board that you're aware of that, that you have that information um, so that you can stay within the ethics and boundaries. And then, you know, one of the things that we ask you to think about as a board is saying that this School Ethics Act is, you know, we would hope that you would consider this to be the minimum accepted behavior and as a board that you would have higher expectations of yourself from that. And I saw that as a board you're approving tonight or working yes, on the, that code of conduct, which yes. is the next step. So that's you know, a way for you as a board to say, you know what, we do have higher expectations. We do um, have a lot more for ourselves than just this minimum that's required. Um, so it was great to see that as a board you're doing that and you're taking that next step. It says a lot about your commitment to work together as a group and your commitment to the community. Um, 
So on behalf of John and I, I want to say thank you. I don't know if we have any other questions that you wanted to ask of us. Board members, any questions? Okay, well, thank, thank you for your time. Thank you. Mr. Burns left his um, business card here. If any board member is interested in his card, the showings is in the packet. Yes, you should add that in there. Add that in there. Like the person who is the location of the And then the whole thing is left on the screen now. Okay, I'm going to move that down. We'll keep one of these packets for um, Maria and for his mother. Right. Also, right. they missed us. And Mr. Rubio, yes. It's not mandatory, right? But he actually.